Good evening, everybody. I would like to bring this November 27th meeting of the select board to order at uh, 7.03. If everybody could stand for the um, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll be starting with public comment, and per the select board policy, public comment is not a discussion, debate, or dialogue between citizens and the select board. It is the citizen's opportunity to express his or her opinion on issues of town business. The board may respond to public comment by taking it under consideration when deliberating on an agenda item or referring to the item to the administration for appropriate action or response. Public comment shall be for a period of up to 15 minutes with speakers being allowed three minutes to present their material. Is anyone here for public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Gerald Brecker, 488 Pleasant Street. Um, I just want to uh, uh, briefly address um, the uh, survey that I was sent, um, ostensibly because I sit on a appointed committee um, involving the issue of DEI. And I'm not going to talk to the merits of DEI or any of that, but I did address uh, comments to the town manager and the assistant town manager, and I received no response uh, from those. And I'm just wondering whether, since this committee, I guess, has been around now for several years, I read through their minutes um, earlier today, uh, what is going on? Is it going to uh, present a report? Uh, is the uh, board, of, uh, the select board, going to uh, act in some way on uh, the workings, if there are any, of this committee? Is uh, there an agenda item is going to be on the select board agenda at any time soon? Uh, will town meeting have an opportunity to weigh in on uh, what uh, this uh, committee has uh, recommended? I know that. I felt that the survey was quite intrusive and inappropriate. I read in their minutes that they're doing other surveys of a similar nature among the middle school children, which I find inappropriate, uh, potentially. I don't know anything about what they're doing, but I thought that was a little strange. Um, and I'm just wondering when the public will be uh, made aware of what this committee is. It's been now operating in the town for several years, since at least 2020. Uh, because as I say, I asked a fairly simple question and got no response. And uh, perhaps it could come on the agenda one of these uh, weeks and uh, we could find out more. So that's my comment for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here for public comment? We're going to move on to governmental reports, and we're going to have an update from our Elder Services Director, Kathy Shelp, on the Senior Center. Good evening. It's nice to see you all tonight. Um, I will quickly just want to update you on, before we get into the building and the move, is uh, that we have received our national accreditation. Um, the Senior Center has that we have met the highest standards in, um, in governance within uh, senior centers. It's issued through the National Council on Aging. Only 2% of the senior centers in the country have it, and we're very proud that we have gotten through that. Right. So um, that's good. Yep. So, um, so now the new building. Um, it's, it's been really busy, really busy. You should be very pleased um, that the, the investment that the town and the taxpayer has made into that building is really coming to fruition and you're seeing it immediately, um, quicker than we actually thought that we would see it. So um, due to the increased volume in what we're doing, we have added seven additional exercise classes that will be all starting by December 1st. Uh, new programs we have. We started a writing program that's run by a volunteer that then continued. People wanted, we had such a waiting list, she ran it again. And the people that were in her class then kind of uh, veered off and they created their own. So, so it is exactly what you want to happen. That's the intention of it and that did work. 
we have an oil painting class, which is new, uh, again, with a really long waiting list to get into that. She's now agreed to come back. The volunteer instructor will now be teaching two sessions starting after the first of the year. So we're really happy to see all of that. Our lectures, they used to get 10 to 12 people in the class. We're now getting 25 to 50 people that are attending lectures. We have been able to address, we had waiting lists on our trips. And due to the fact that we've got the uh, van driver full time last year in the budget, we were able to double up on those trips and to serve everyone on the waiting list on those. So that's please. In our trips, we are going to have two overnight trips this year, which is new for us, and also our first international trip that we're using um, Colette Tours and a local escort, uh, North Avenue resident that will be escorting that trip. So um, that's going to Prague, Budapest, and Vienna. So, yeah, it's going in October. If anyone would like to go, please see me afterwards. Um, we have also uh, started back up the congregate meal. There used to be uh, in the senior center every day there would be a lunch. Then COVID came, <coughs> excuse me, and then we never went back to it because of the, it just was not a suitable process when they first went back. They have changed the process again. So now we've started the, the daily lunch only three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and we're averaging 100 people coming into those meals. So that's, that's excellent. 100 people a week, not a day. Um, so um, our, our transportation, which last year, again, we came, we asked for a full-time driver because our transportation was up. Since September 1, our transportation is up when compared to last year at this time, up 30% again on top of what it was up last year. So in 2022, from September 1st to November 31st, the Senior Center served 662 people 8,694 times. This year, in 2023, from September 1st to November 27th till today, we served 911 people 14,107 times. So we have almost doubled the amount of times that people are being served um, within the senior center. Um, so to put that in perspective, our receptionist is the one that takes, I don't want to say the brunt of it, but she takes a lot of it. She's answering every phone call, and she is literally registering those 14,000 times of registering people. My, I apologize, my watch is ringing. <laughs> I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> I'm not used to it. Um, so she's actually having to register these 14,000 times. So a lot of this work, and I do have to say that I hate calling out staff in particular, but Chris Rock has been the rock um, and, and serving and handling all of that coming to the door, people coming to the counter, the phone ring, ringing, um, and she has really taken a lot of that on and just couldn't be more pleased with what she's done for that. Um, and just one little final uh, statistic. So the last year for fiscal year 23 that we were in, in the other building, we purchased 4,000 coffee cups for the entire year. So far in this year, we have gone through 4,000 coffee cups. So we know and we see that, and that's actually a good sign because that's people that are coming in and just being in the center. They're coming in for coffee, for a donut, and to just relax and, and to be there. So we're really just quite pleased at all of that. So you have any questions? That's kind of in a nutshell. Or do I? Yes. I do. Um, before the center was built, there was concern of getting people to the center, getting transportation, because they were so used to being downtown mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. Have you, uh, obviously you haven't found that to be a problem with numbers increasing such in such a fashion, but. No, and, and we're not aware of anyone that's not coming because of that. Like, so, so our transportation is up, um, and uh, so we, we don't think it's a problem. So there's to nobody know. from that was coming to the old center that you're not seeing at the new center? Correct. Okay. Correct. 
And not the old center. <laughs> What's the that? Old center. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, wherever it is from here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So what are some of the popular activities there? I mean, I know we have the pool table, we have other gaming facilities, we have the gym. So the, the lectures are extremely, extremely popular. We, we right now have a, a monthly series on, on the presidents that grows by word of mouth every month. And so, so we have to move it out of the room it was in and move it into the big dining room because the, the, the classroom wouldn't handle the number of people. We had a lecture on the Israeli Hamas uh, conflict. We had 50 people that attended that. So, so the lectures are very popular. We do a weekly movie. That's a, a current movie. Um, we showed Oppenheimer um, on Wednesday, and we had 50 people that came to that. That's a good number. Our large events. We have this Thursday. Um, we have a lunch, and then two people that are uh, doing um, Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And um, we have 100 people coming, and we have 40 people on a waiting list to come to that. So, so those, those events are very popular as well. Exercise classes are just, we need a bigger room. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, they are just so we're trying to manage getting getting the exercise classes in. Um, surprisingly enough, there's not been a lot of activity on the pool table, but we we've also been down two part-time staff people during all of this. So just today, we had our new uh, part-time program coordinator, Telly Abernathy. We're so happy to have her. Had started with us, so it, her wheels are already going and getting some pool tournaments and, and different things going on to, to get people in. She is terrific. She's yes, she phenomenal. Is. We're really very lucky yeah. to have her. Excited, excited. Great. So, Kathy, could you just touch on the Thanksgiving? Um, day dinner up at the oh, Stevens uh, Estate. Oh, uh, um, yes. Uh, so we had uh, Thanksgiving up at Stevens Estate. Fireside Catering did did the event. They did a phenomenal job. Um, as always, the food, we had 180 people in attendance, and we served 88 meals that were delivered by the policemen. Um, so that was, and the food all came out hot, all at the same time, delicious, wonderful. Uh, this year, the police were great. They put in a... Uh, a light on the, well, you know that driveway is very curvy and dark. So halfway up, they put in a, a, a light tower. It made a huge difference. Um, so we're hoping if, I don't know if DPW has a light tower, that next year the parking lot is very dark and we were out with flashlights trying to get people out. So if we can light up that parking lot next year, it's a great event. People just love it and uh, phenomenally successful. The, the um, photos look and Fireside yeah. does it all, uh, you know, just with a smile. The numbers just, you know, we have 88 for home delivery. Is that okay? Whatever you have, we'll, we'll, we'll bring you. And uh, so they've just wonderful. That's great. And they great donate all the food. And the food is all donated. It's everything. The service, they, they, um, they bring the servers. Everything is all it's donated. It's nice addition to the community. It's wonderful, mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Really Thank you. <laughs> All right. Our next update will be on our fiscal year 24 first quarter financials. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm um, happy to say that everything is um, in line and where we would expect it to be at this point in the fiscal year. Our property tax revenues are about 25.9%. About which is right in line with where we were last year, which was about 23.9. Um, our motor vehicle excise tax is up a little bit, um, but 1% from where it usually would be. Our first quarter on mails tax is um, exactly where we would expect. The ambulance fees are at 30%, which is exactly where we were last year as well. The one thing that maybe is up more than usual would be our inspections fees. So that's building, plumbing, electric. Um, that's at 31% already, which is actually Interesting, because if you remember correctly, we waived the fees for anybody who was affected by the storm. So I um, was surprised to see that. Um, and then our, our interest income, just the treasurer, um, Kim Mackey, has been doing such an amazing job with that. We've actually already exceeded the budget um, revenue number for that, so by $2,800. So she's really done a fabulous job on that. As far as our expenses, we're running at approximately 29%, which is where you would expect them to be. Um, as a reminder, we are deficit spending due to um, the storms and our local state of emergency. So 
we'll be watching that to see if there's anything that's going to have to be transferred or a free cash article at town meeting. But right now, we are where we should be at this point in the year. So, could you go back to did you say the, the building permits are at 31%? Or We've collected, 13%. we're at 31% right now which is 6% higher than where it was okay. last year. Because I was going to say, this at this time, yeah. it's mainly you know, late winter, early spring. And, yeah. And, and, yeah. Okay. So I'm surprised to see it is where, I'm surprised to see that we are where we are with that, because we don't really have any huge projects right now. Um, so we'll be keeping an eye on that. I know Paul and Joel and his team have been really busy, so. Melissa, historically, when you see something that may vary a little bit from budget, maybe it's ahead of a run rate, do, do you, does that tend to compound itself and continue throughout the year, or does it really vary quarter to quarter? Not always. It very much varies quarter to okay. quarter. So, for instance, mails tax, it's up $7,200 from where we usually are, but if we have a bad winter, next quarter will be down. Gotcha. Um, and so it's really hard to kind of know. The ambulance service, we increased the fees last year, so that run I expect to be pretty close to where it typically would be. Motor vehicle excise, I'm hopeful that that might actually be a trend on being higher than usual because I think cars are now available when last year cars were not. Um, and additionally, cars are worth more than they were before, and eventually the state will catch up with that. So I think we may start to see that running at a higher level, which would be great. Um, but it does tend to even itself out. Except that interest income. That I expect to come in well over, which is good news. And on the expense portion, and you mentioned we're deficit spending because of the storms, um, are there, I mean, expenses are obviously a little bit more predictable than the income portion. I mean, does that, do we front load some of this stuff in the first quarter? Are there any kind of one-time things that really outside of the storms that we typically see or no? There is. So okay. there's certain bills, for instance, a lot of the time our insurance is that we'll prepay because we'll get money off by doing that. Um, and so we, but we account for all of that in the budget. But you tend to see a little bit more spent in the beginning of the year in those yeah. instances. Thank you very much for the no update. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to ask our new town planner, Zach, to come up and talk to us about accelerated dwelling units. Hi everyone, I'm Zach, if you haven't met me, Zach Melcher, the new staff planner as of a couple months ago, and I'm here to present the results uh, for the survey regarding accessory dwelling units that we issued a couple months ago. Uh, just for, for some background information about what accessory dwelling units are, they're an additional residential building that occupies the same lot as a primary residence, and they can either be attached to the primary residence or detached as an accessory structure. So on the right I included some photo um, examples, you can see some of them are attached to the primary structure and some of them are separate from the primary dwelling. So when uh, they're separate, they don't have to have any kind of a, a common wall or anything, or like a hallway. If it's labeled as detached, then no, it's completely separate okay, from the primary structure. So you're saying like a carriage house or something? Yeah, like just separate from the primary dwelling, but on the same property. And as you're aware, I'm sure, um, one of the goals of the select board for FY24 was to explore the feasibility of introducing the option for residents to create ADUs on their properties. And we issued this survey just to gain feedback and kind of start the conversation regarding accessory dwelling units. Um, like I had said, the survey was issued on October 2nd and it ran into October 17th. And in total, we got 233 responses from the town. So the beginning part of the survey, we kind of asked some just some background demographic questions, such as people's ages, um, do they rent or own their primary residence, and the relationship with the town. Um, in terms of age ranges, there was kind of a mix, but majority of the respondents were above the age of 35, um, as well as majority of the respondents owned their primary residence, and majority of the respondents lived in the town of North Andover, according to the survey. And um, for the next section of the survey, um, we kind of um, laid out some statements about the potential benefits of accessory dwelling units. Uh, so the first statement we asked if accessory dwelling units can be an effective way to maximize use of existing infrastructure and 70% of respondents agree or disagree that with that statement. 
Um, and then the same, the next question was kind of along the same lines about uh, maximizing use of existing infrastructure. Um, we asked people if ADUs can be an effective way to increase the number of available housing units, but not at the expense of open land. And around the same number, 70% agreed or somewhat agreed with that statement. Um, another potential benefit of ADUs that we kind of pulled people about in the survey were about um, increasing the, the availability of affordable housing. Um, and 61% agreed with the statement that ADUs can positively impact affordable housing supply. So once again, um, majority of people agreed with uh, the potential benefits of ADUs. Um, the next section, um, we asked about how people felt about attached versus detached accessory dwelling units. So kind of to go back to the beginning of the presentation where I talked about how there are two different types of accessory dwelling units. Some are attached to the primary structure, usually as um, additional living space in the garage or the basement of a property. And a detached ADU is completely separate from the primary structure. It's usually like a garage that's separate. Um, and for the first question, we asked if ADU should only be permitted if they're created by converting existing space within the primary dwelling, um, which means that um, is basically asking if people think that ADU should only be allowed if they are attached to the main structure and they already exist in that space. And in regards to that, 65, around 65% 65 of people disagreed with that statement that um, ADU should only exist if they're attached to the primary structure. And the next question was about asking people if um, it was more about the attached versus detached um, contingencies in terms of ADUs. So around 65% of people agreed or disagreed about um, converting existing structures that are already on that property into an accessory dwelling unit if ADUs were to be permitted in the town of North Andover. And the next part about the survey was about residency. Um, so just for some context, um, under the current family suite guidelines, um, property owners are not prohi are prohibited from living in accessory structures. So um, we were kind of just gauging um, feedback on if if there were to be an ADU bylaw implemented, if people felt that the property owners would be able to choose if they live in the primary structure or the accessory structure. And according to the survey, about 70% of people agreed that it's up to the discretion of the property owner if they want to live in the primary or the accessory structure. Um, in the next part of the survey, um, we kind of out, we kind of outlined some potential guidelines for um, accessory dwelling units. Um, and asked, you know, just kind of wanted to get feedback on what people thought about um, some sort of, like, sort of design guidelines, you know, standard for typical zoning bylaws. Um, the first one was about size limitations in regards to the accessory dwelling units. And um, we kind of used 900 square feet as a baseline because under the state definition of accessory dwelling units, they use um, 900 square feet of gross floor area. Um, of the principal dwelling, and it's worth noting that they use gross floor area instead of net area, and I included a definition. It's really just all the area within the exterior walls. Um, and in regards to the um, results of the survey, it was, I mean, there was no prevailing answer, but the least common answer was that the uh, restriction should be less than 900 square feet, but there wasn't really a consensus on exactly what the most favorable restriction or set of guidelines should be in terms of size limitations. Um, and then the next um, part of the survey, we asked about how people felt about what ADU should be limited to in terms of number of bedrooms. And in this part, um, the most common answer was there should be a two bedroom maximum uh, with about 31% of the vote, but there was definitely mixed results. There wasn't really an overwhelming majority for any of the different options, but the most common one was a two bedroom maximum. And then the next part, we asked about um, parking accommodations uh, per, for a potential ADU mandate. And um, kind of similar to the last question where there wasn't really an overwhelming major majority for one of the answers, but the most popular answer getting around 41% of the vote was that um, accessory dwelling units should have to accommodate for one parking spot if they were to be implemented in the town of North Andover. And um, I just wanted to touch on some things that were going on at the state level and um, kind of how it, how it coincides with the timeline of the survey. Um, like I had said earlier, we issued the survey October 2nd. We closed it on October 17th. And coincidentally, on the 18th, uh, Governor Healy released a housing bond bill 
to address affordability and housing supply in Massachusetts. And as part of that um, housing bond bill, there was a provision that would mandate communities in Massachusetts to permit ADUs. Um, and like I said, this was purely coincidental. We really um, didn't know that it was just going to line up the way that it did, but we thought it would be important to address, um, you know, that part of the housing bond bill and just kind of give more context as to what's going on at the state level. Um, before I kind of dive into the specifics of, of um, what's in the Affordable Homes Act, I just want to say that none of the parameters are set in stone, and as the legislative process goes on, these are subject to change. Um, these are not final, like, there, it's not like tomorrow there's going to be a mandate that comes into play that every community has to have a bylaw, and these are the exact specifications. Um, there's no guarantee that the bylaw gets passed at all, or that it looks the exact same it does right now, but I just wanted to outline what the proposition was, and if it does get passed, um, there's, there, would, there would definitely be some guidance from the state um, when it comes to implementation of the bylaw. So, so Zach, with yeah. an ADU, there's no restriction on who rents that. Then. Like today, I believe uh, with our family suites, it, it, it's restricted to only family members renting that. But yeah, all ADU, of, there's no restrictions there. I'll touch on that, but yeah, as part of um, the bill, there's no restriction on who can uh, stay in the accessory dwelling. But I'll touch on that. Um, and just for context, I'll leave it up for a minute or two. If you want to read the exact language that's in the bill, I'd include everything, but this was just the main um, portion that was contained in the bill. So with regard to this, is, is it anticipated that um, local zoning codes such as setback requirements and all that would still stay as they are, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, and I, I'll touch on that, okay. but there are like additional restrictions and, you know, things that are left up to the municipality if this were to be implemented. But this is the, the language that was in the Great. Portable Homes Act. But, um, and then I just have a summary of uh, what was in that body of text as well as some other stuff in regards to that. Um, so I'll just kind of go through some of them. Um, the first point is that the um, accessory dwelling unit would have to have a separate entrance from the primary dwelling, even if it was attached or detached, you know, it would have to have its own entrance. Um, and the uh, size restriction would be 900 square feet or half the gross floor area of the principal dwelling, whichever is smaller. So that kind of uh, coincides with the number that we had in our survey, as well as the state definition of an accessory dwelling unit. Um, the next point is that ADUs would have to be allowed by right in single family zoning districts. Um, so just in that in single family zoning districts, there would be no special permit required. They would have to be allowed by right. Um, and then one part of that also touched on how um, ADUs could be attached or detached. Like I said, there's you know two different kinds. Some are attached to the primary structure and some are separate from the primary structure. And based on the text that was in the housing bond bill, um, Hypothetically, the ADU could be detached or detached from the primary structure. And another part about from the housing bond bill was that there would be no restrictions on owner occupancy, uh, which means that both the primary and the accessory unit could be rented out. Um, but part of the part of the housing bond bill states that um, short-term rentals could be prohibited, which I'll touch on later in this presentation because I know that was a concern from a lot of people. But it does have language about prohibiting short-term rentals, um, and then. To your point about how um, it's still subject to other reg regulations like Title V requirements, site plan review, setbacks, bulk and height of structures, that sort of thing. And then in terms of parking, um, the bill stated that w the ADUs would have to accommodate for one parking space unless they were within a half mile of public transit, then there would be no parking requirement. But that's just a summary of everything that was in the bill. Um, and then in addition to the multiple choice questions and the kind of the Likert scale questions, we had an open-ended section where people could voice their opinions or touch on anything that maybe we didn't touch on in the survey. And um, I think the biggest thing that came up was people concerned about the possibility of ADUs being used as short-term rentals like Airbnbs. 
Um, but like I just mentioned, in the housing bill, it does state that municipalities can impose restrictions on these kind of short-term rentals. Um, so I, it's def I just thought it was important to address that, and a lot of people have voiced their concern about um, the possibility of short-term rentals. Um, as well as there were, there were people that voiced their opinion that um, the current family suite guidelines should stay as is and there should be restrictions on who can um, reside in, in accessory structures. Um, and there were also people that brought up concerns about traffic congestion, um, changing the character of the community, and then um, there were a lot of questions about property taxes and how accessory dwelling units would affect assessed value of houses and property taxes of properties that have accessory dwelling units. Um, in terms of next steps, on December 7th, we have our next meeting for the housing production plan update. Um, it's at the Senior Center from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, we welcome anyone to come. Um, and as part of that uh, housing production plan meeting, we're having breakout sessions, and one of them is about um, accessory dwelling units. So we're not done getting feedback from residents about ADUs. Um, so if anyone feels like they have more to say about them, um, definitely feel free to join us on December 7th. Um, but this process is definitely um, still ongoing. We're still engaging residents. Um, and we will, we're, we're going to monitor um, this legislation um, and, you know, we'll provide updates as, as it goes along. We, like I said, we, there's no guarantee that it passes. We don't know when or how, how long. If it does pass, we don't know how long it's going to take. And then, you know, if it does pass, um, we'll work with the state on drafting a bylaw, um, you know, and that's, that's where we're at. That's all I got. I have, I have a question on the, the basement dwelling. Yeah. Um, code pretty much says now that you cannot have someone sleeping in a basement unless there is direct access to the outside, maybe. Um, yeah. So, but you said you, something along the lines, well, you need to have direct access to the main dwelling unit. So that would be your access to get out. You'd have to go upstairs and... I think you would have to have, yeah, in terms of basement dwellings, I think... It might not work out in regards to the regulations because you have to have its own separate entrance. So, or sometimes it's a, in some communities it's an oversized window that you could crawl out. <laughs> you know, suppose you'll get through anyway. Yeah. Anything if there was a problem in the building. Yeah. Um, but so I thought that was a little confusing because it's. I mean, I would imagine safety yeah. first. Um, so. well, I would envision probably as a separate entrance it, altogether, like a bulkhead entrance. Right. Like Probably not even room. a bulkhead. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually it's difficult to get out of. Yeah, 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 it's usually not a bulkhead. Yeah. I was thinking um, more a walk up, like a split level. Like, walk. Yeah. <laughs> or a, it's ground level and there's just a door that goes out, like oh, right. a split entry yeah. or something like that. But so we wouldn't be looking to change things that would make it more difficult for people to get out. I would presume. That no, I mean it's just under the you know the the the, the guidelines that were kind of proposed by the state, um, if it had to maintain a separate entrance, um, I assume, you know, it would be, it'd definitely get complicated if it was a basement unit. So in, in terms of attached structures, I envision that it would be more feasible that it would be like an attic or maybe a, another room of, like of the house that was considered livable space and that would be rented out in terms of, instead of just a basement, if that makes sense. And it wouldn't really make any difference to R4, which is multifamily zoned which is a good portion of the town, probably from 125 um, to the Lawrence line is probably all R4. Yeah. And that is for, um, I know people are surprised because there's a lot of single family, but it is pretty much zoned R4 or other things like business or whatever. But hmm, it's interesting and I do think it will add, certainly add more housing and during tough economic times, maybe help some of the families that live in the house give them more opportunities as money comes in. It is, it's interesting, so. Yeah. No, we don't have to wait for our, for the state to craft our own bylaw. We would just need to adjust if the state does pass something. Yeah, correct. That's, so that's we correct. could move forward with our yeah. own town bylaw, right? Correct. Yeah. And, that, and that bylaw would have all these different things. Yeah, and those there'd requirements, be different parameters. Whether we allow detached or not, right. or parking spots or square footage, all that would be in our, mm -hmm. our own bylaw, right? Correct, okay. yeah. Talk to me a little about the short-term rentals. I mean, is there a definition of, of short-term? Um, mm -hmm. As far, I mean, I like as far as I'm aware, there's no, it, there, I haven't looked 
too far into the, the housing bill in terms of short term, but it, I just know there is a provision in there that says um, it's, it's, you know, it's up to the municipality that they're allowed to res put restrictions on short term okay. rentals. But in terms of specifics of short term, um, I'm not entirely sure if that's in yeah, that you know, specific yeah. guidance. Or Could not. we define that in the bylaw? Yeah. 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 Define the it themselves. Define them in, okay. in monitoring. Short -term and, 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 yeah, the monitoring. And how, yeah, how is it enforced? Is, yeah. Is, yeah, I mean, yeah. so there are some, for instance, I know some of has um, a bylaw, and I'm sure Jean probably has read some as well, but there are communities that do now have Airbnb um, bylaws and rules. Um, some, a lot of Cape Towns have created those as well. Um, interestingly, you know, if you do look at North Andover, there, we do have quite a few Airbnbs now, so it's probably something that we should start to explore whether or not we go down the EDU path or not. Would the building department enforce that? The building department, yep. Um, Zach, you mentioned um, property taxes as one of the concerns. Can you expand on that a little bit in terms of what the questions were regarding property taxes? Or um, I think there were just questions around um, if the assessed value, like how the assessed value of a property would change based on if they included additional structure on their property, um, and that you know how tax value would would change um, if there was. If someone were cho cho chose to implement an accessory building unit on the property, if it was permitted, in this, um, generally speaking, it would go. It would increase. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the more I mean, yeah, yeah. more bedrooms, yeah. more, yeah. Bedrooms, yeah. Right? more yeah. square footage, more. Right. More of a question for Bill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it would be considered yeah. an improvement. So yeah. you pull yeah. permits, we'd go out and inspect it. Read um, when I read that so comment, I actually wondered if the person was perhaps looking at it from a different angle and saying that it was going to decrease property values because it was going to make for more dense neighborhoods. Um, so I think, you know, arguably you could look at it, I guess, that way. But if anything, I think you'd actually see an increase in values. Why would the density decrease the value? So I don't think it would, but that's how I read the comment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you go to the end of the survey, which um, Zach has linked, you can kind of read what just that's what people comment. wrote and yeah. the tone of that comment. That's where I thought that okay. they were going towards. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that too. Um, in this presentation, like if you go to the agenda, <laughs> I have a link to all the survey results. So if you want to look at the open-ended responses, you, you know you can, or just what other people were answering and stuff. Do you have any information, and you may not, that's okay, yeah. about other communities that have implemented an ADU and, like, how many have actually popped up because of that? Because what I have heard is it ultimately is not very many, but I don't mm -hmm. have data to support that, so. Yeah, no, I haven't looked too far into other communities in terms of ADUs, but I know that there are communities that have definitely, like, explored the possibility and some that have actually implemented a bylaw, but I don't know um, the extent to which you know, ADUs have actually been constructed or been accessory structures have been converted into ADUs in the towns that have those kind of bylaws. <coughs> but okay. that'd be something to look into. Yeah. I don't think I'd see it popping up everywhere. Yeah. Like no, by, I, by I, need, you know? I think what I have in mind is I, Haverhill specifically did it recently, and I think they've had about five in the many years that it's been an option in Haverhill. But I don't want to speak to it because I don't have, you know, the data so limited me. by lot sizes. Yes, and there's setbacks. still there's so right, many. There are so many. Still have to things that requirements that still need to be met. Mm -hmm. That it doesn't mean that everybody is Can able to do it. To do mm -hmm. one, right? Any other questions or comments? No, it was a really good yeah. report. Though you did a, yeah. a nice job with it. Thank you so much. And I, I think that's actually a great number of responses. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, so, I was happy with the amount yeah. of feedback. Yeah. 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 So thank you. Yeah. This is a lot of work. So thank you for compiling it for us. Welcome aboard. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to new business, and we're going to talk about the emergency flood relief program with our opera funds. And I'll be Laurie. Yes, thank you. Um, so, as you're aware, you had uh, authorized some opera funds to be used for the flood relief, and to date, we've had eighty-three thousand six hundred and sixty-eight dollars expended from those funds, um, but that's, that's a still a good chunk left. We started the program so that it would just be for the repair or replacement of appliances because we weren't sure how many people um, would take advantage of it. And um, I think that mostly everybody who had some repair or replacement of appliances has pretty much taken care of it either through insurance or through other means or have 
taken advantage of the program. So we're wondering if you want to open it up to include um, other things like personal belongings, uh, sheetrock, floor covering, and if you still want to keep the date as August 18th. So one of the conditions that we had in there was you had to have filed the information with us by August 18th when that first email went out asking people for information um, on their damages. I think people have um, either don't know about it because it was not advertised, it was only sent to the people who were on the list. So I don't know how, um, what the reaction is going to be if you open it up to everybody who hadn't um, filled out the initial information form. It could be a step that you open it up to everybody that filled out that form to cover yep. their personal items, or their floor coverings, whatever else was not covered by the first one. And then maybe we come back and open it up again. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I think if it gets sent out um, to everybody, we might be inundated and the funds might be depleted have. quickly. Is it possible that we stick to the original, like, heaters and you know the appliances but expand to the everyone reach to everyone and see uh, you, you could do that too um, my only comment on that is we did have people who actually filled out the application submitted everything prior to August 18th but they didn't qualify because they didn't have an appliance like somebody okay. had to replace their entire floor okay. somebody had to rip down all the walls can we, um, can we maybe like yeah. stick, help, yeah. those, no, stick, stick with those people? <laughs> <laughs> have, sorry, that was a poor choice of words. Stick with those people that you originally filled <laughs> out the um, the form and maybe didn't qualify for the original, you know, appliances, yeah. Yeah. Um, but now have lost other things. I don't know about personal items. Personal I was going to say, well, that's the only thing. Right? Some sure. people had computers, so I I don't know if you wanted to do electronics or anything, but it's. We could do Think flooring and walls. Yeah. Well, that, is that the one with cars? Oh, cars. Can we the thing with expand the floors to and the walls, though, that's, that's mold and mildew. That is yeah. a health issue. Like right. Like every, rugs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the rugs, yeah. and that's, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, just tossing this out, what if we approached it more from a deductible amount? So much of the deductible that we would cover or whatever or give towards a deductible and then they file yeah. against their own insurance company. But they mostly didn't So they're coverage. not covered. They're not covered. Yeah. That's the whole flood. Are they tenants? Oh. No, because no, it's flood. Because it's a flood. So oh, they, these people course. didn't get. Yeah. yeah, you're right about that. I mm -hmm. So I can just give you flood. some examples. Um, so one was like an electrical, a couple people who had submitted information, they were electrical panels. Yeah. I feel like right. Yeah. Um, so I guess you'd want to include that. Um, like I said, floors. Um, drywall. Drywall. Yeah. drywall. Yeah. Is reasonable to cover because yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think carpet it's reasonable removal. To yeah, a couple of you know mold and water restoration. But then we did also did have like laptops, TVs, but I think that's hard. I think it's, okay, yeah. that's, a little, that's more yeah. discretionary. Yeah. So do we have a ballpark? So, two hundred ninety-one applied, forty-six qualified for some level. So that leaves you know, two hundred fifty. No, no, no. Two hundred ninety-one were qualified to apply. So the email. Oh, they completed the form. I'm sorry. Okay. They, they completed the initial the form. So they received an email. Okay. Saying, we have this grant program. If you've had a loss, fill out this thing. So we can send that out to that yeah. same group again, letting them know that the program's still in effect. Yes. That, it, in fact, we had a woman today. contact us today okay. that f totally qualified under the old thing for her furnace had to be replaced, but she just had never applied because she didn't um, think that she was going to have to replace it at the time, but she does. So, um, Are there people that applied and completed after August 18th that would apply? Would there are people, there were some people that did go on and complete the damage information form after the 18th. The 18th was our deadline to yeah. get it mm -hmm. into the state. Right. So that's, that's why we chose yeah. it. I mean, would we be opposed to extending that date to some people? Yeah, how how many, many people would that uh, be? Let's see. She's got the spreadsheet up that we worked on. It's like, I can't look at it. It's giving me uh, post-traumatic stress disorder here. But
that many though, because we closed it. We did close it. It's probably less than 20. Yeah. Oh, here we go. And they we, probably all don't qualify, right? We manually entered some that called after we closed the form. Um, some of those are businesses. Mm -hmm. Just because we wanted to document somewhere yes, in case the numbers yes. came so big that we wanted Mima to reopen. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, uh, probably about fifty. Yeah, probably about probably about fifty. Fifty. Fifty in addition. Before we shut the form off. Mm -hmm. But would all fifty qualify? No. Uh, Some of those are businesses. So they have any the other There's money. another, yeah, talk of money for this. Personal belongings, equipment, carpet. They may. Some of them may. Walls, yeah. But don't we carpet. think about starting by expanding the offering to the people who already qualified, and then if there's still money, add those yeah, additional. Go back people? You know, get those folks that got in just a little mm -hmm. over the wire. And you, You've what would be the time frame? Bit, like, how long would you give them to apply? Is sort of like, what do you think is a fair amount of time? I mean, we month? still have it yeah. open. Yeah, we've yeah. left it open okay. because you okay. know we don't know. Great trick. We're right. requiring paid receipts. So that was another, oh, like, job. one of the yep. women didn't, it's, hadn't had the work done yeah, yet. Yeah, it's taking so a long time for to, people to so get that's the why work done. we just left that's it open. True. It is, it really Contracts is. is and it's possible when we send the second email out that it may mm -hmm. generate um, trigger it mm -hmm. for other people that had already qualified. Okay. So we could, really, you could send it out, and at our next meeting we could talk about the next round, right? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. that'll right. be a few so weeks. Do yeah. Walls. Walls, carpet. Floors. Flooring, those yeah. electrical panels. Yeah. Those, are, those are things where yeah, those are really need, important. Those are things that is there need anything to be. Oh yeah, you can't be living in mold that. Of mold of mold. I'm just I'm thinking out loud right now because yeah. the electrical panels made me think about that. I mean, you know, if they beyond panels, they have to do rewiring yeah. of elect, general electrical service. It's very you know, expensive. If, if yeah. outlets got you could do wiring and panels. Yeah. You should say wiring and panels. Right. And you're right. Especially if it's high. We did hot water heaters already. That's good. We did. Yeah, we did all. And the only other thing would. Would be vehicles. Vehicles. Now, we have a lot of auto So we have a lot. We have a lot of people who have reached out to us who are parked in the Mills parking lot, mm -hmm. um, who owed more on their car than they got back for their insurance. Um, a lot of them were employees of the restaurant. Again, this would only be open to North Andover residents, but we have heard from people who basically ended up being upside down after they were paid out by their insurance. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people at like the Market Basket Plaza. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard the kids flooded. talking, like, as yeah. they were stocking I, shelves. Maybe at cars, we may have to table, I think. Yeah, I think wait on that until yeah. next yeah. time, maybe, and see what and we I get think, with this. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it, and they were able to get used, go through insurance. Well, it may yes. not have worked out well for them. Homeowners were not able to get any no, insurance. Thanks. And Greater Lawrence was really helpful. We had a, a couple yes. of people who um, had issues with their cars, and they were able to reach out to them, and so they have been helping, school? too. Is that what you're saying? No, um, the my candidate. Action Council. Thank you, the Community Action yeah. Council. Yeah. So they've been really good. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we need a motion to vote on this? Yes. Or? Please. Yeah, we'll take a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the select board approve the expansion of the emergency flood relief program to include flooring, walls, and electrical items as qualifying expenses for reimbursement. Uh, really testing electrical items, maybe electrical service. Electrical service? Yeah. 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 I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, you. Thank you again, Lori, for all your work. I know keeping that spreadsheet's not easy. <laughs> Although I love a good spreadsheet. Gives so. me a headache. She's a professional at yeah. all of this. <laughs> oh, unfortunately. And just while we're talking about the emergency flood relief program, I'll just let you know that um, at the beginning, mid of the month, we had 20 businesses who had applied and were qualified for a total of $77,307. We still have $173,000 left in that. Um, more may have been spent over the last 20 days. I just, this is um, the last update I got on this. So if there is still funding left in that, we'll come before you and ask for changes to that as well. Do you have a sense of how many businesses are back up and running? Or how, how many are, not, I guess, maybe not up and running? I've only heard of a, of a 
small handful who are not up and running. Some are up and running, but not in their same space mm -hmm. because they're still working on their, their, Current, original, their space. original space. Yes, and we'll eventually move back. Okay. Um, obviously, Jamie's Good Day Cafe, both are not up and running. The toy um, company. The toy company, they're operating in a different space. Um, a lot of the addresses on the business one are High Street addresses, um, or Charles, High Street, Charles Street, Sutton Street, uh, Water Street, where we would expect to have seen. Mm -hmm. um, and the majority of them did qualify for the full 5,000. We'll move on to um, the request from Rabbi Asher Bronstein of the Shabbat of Merrimack Valley to place the menorah on the town common. Do we have anybody? No. Okay. Any discussion? We do this every year? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Quite a few years. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll move approval. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We we'll look forward to that. The actual event will be on the 14th, although Hanukkah starts on the 6th? 7th. 7th. And the menorah will be up for the yes. 7th. It will. Okay. All right. Um, so item C, we're going to actually um, table for tonight and move to our January agenda. And we'll move on to our requests from the Friends of Memorial Park for a sign at Patriots Memorial Park. Hi, I'm Leslie Frazier. 24 Cobblestone Circle. I'm here with Phyla Slade and Norma Bachman. We were part of a group of six of us um, who are members of the Improvement Society, the Friends of Memorial Park, the Garden Club or Neighbors, and most of us were part of each one of those. So, um, <laughs> so we got together um, initially to redo a brochure that we had ha have had for years and years and years for Memorial Park with a map of the planting. The plantings have changed so much that it's impossible to keep that up all the time. So we have updated that. But what we decided we also would like would be a sign within the park. Um, the sign would be, let me show you the sign. This is 16 by 22. And it would be a sign that would be set sort of like that on a granite post. It would be made of, of vinyl clad aluminum alloy. So it would has some thickness to it. And um, it would have, I have, a mock-up of what we've been drafting. It's not a total um, finished product yet. We're not looking at this until probably next spring. But um, I will pass these around. This is a, the d latest design idea. Um, I, I don't have enough for everybody, but you can sure. pass them out. The position of the sign would be if you're coming out of the library and entering the park on the corner of Main Street and Middlesex, right there is the rock that ma marks the Vietnam and Korean conflict. Um, that's the, it's a sizable rock with a plaque on it. Behind that, the paths converge and uh, there's a group of uh, mock orange trees there that would be a nice background for a sign. It wouldn't interfere with the <coughs> monument itself. It would be behind that. So um, I'll pass this around too. This is a picture of where we're talking. If, um, as you're looking, as you're standing here by the rock, the library would be back and to your right. So I can just pass that around. The idea of the sign is to explain just briefly to people um, some of the history of the park, its significance, and its purpose. Its purpose is to honor um, men and women from who have contributed in the civil or military nature um, to either the state or the nation. 
and it started as a place to um, have the World War Monument, thinking that was going to be the final World War. And since then, we've added the Second World War Monument, and we've added the one for the uh, Korean and Vietnam conflicts. Um, the park is well used. I work there a lot, weeding or picking up sticks, whatever I'm doing. And uh, periodically, I get people who will ask a few questions, and I tend to try and engage them so that they understand that the park is 100 years old, that it was designed by the Olmsted brothers. Most people don't understand that. A lot of people don't know who the Olmsted brothers are. Um, but it's a significant um, park in that it's basically intact from what the original design was. We, have, we restored it. Phyla led the charge in 98. We, we rededicated it. But that's, you know, 30 years ago. So um, things have changed since then. Um, on that um, mock-up that I just sent around, you'll see a QR code. Our idea is that people can go to the QR code and then as trees come down, trees go in, we can update that. And so we're not repre reprinting a brochure all the time. Um, the brochure we have in updating it, I can just show you um, an idea of the map. Oops. Um, the map, we've now made it colorful. It was always in black and white. And we have a list of the plantings over here so that someone can walk around with the map or on their phone with the QR code <clears throat> to identify the trees, the plantings that they want. So um, our idea is trying to update things. The sign would be a little more contemporary than, um, than like the bronze plaques that we have around. But I think the bronze plaques tend not to be red. They, people tend to walk right by them. If this is a little more eye-catching and um, succinct, um, I think that it could do its job. And, and people who are curious about more information can go to that QR code. It'll go to our brochure with links to Frederick Law Olmsted or to the Stevens family or um, many things, many different things. So, just so a we question would on love the sign. your approval. Oh. <laughs> a question on the sign. Um, so the mock-up you gave us, obviously this is um, just the text that's going to be on there, but it's the, the center here will actually match the surrounding, right? It won't be like a, like a brown like this, will it, is it? Or I guess... Is this the, what the sign is intended to look like? When it's, it's pretty close. Yeah, the text is, will change a bit, I know. But um, it's pretty close. To, okay. Um, we just received that last night. So um, it may be tweaked a bit, but that's about it. Those are the, that's the soldier and the sailor. Oh, you yeah, know, I get that, but I was just wondering about the middle here. Is this going to be brown like this, or is it going to be more in, you know, more in the same color as the, si the surrounding the soldiers? Going to blend in. Yeah. Is it going to look like more bronze? Is that yeah, more. Mean? Well, you but you just kind of answered that yeah. question. You said the bronze. Yeah, you I don't feel the bronze signs are red all that much, so you think this would be red more. It, this yeah. is a vinyl picture of that that goes on to the sign. If you've seen the signs um, around the old center, it's done in the same process as they have. There's a um, the trustees have a set of signs to mark the Stevens to Stevens Trail mm -hmm. in several places. That's the same kind yeah, of a sign. Okay. Um, this we're going to put on a granite post rather than on a um, pressure treated post, just because we thought it would look nicer. Um, Is but they are. There's one on the little um, hay scales building at the old center, there's one on, the, there are three big signs, but done with the same process on the big, on the um, brick store. On the red hay scales building, there's one for the knitting um, business, and that's done in the same manner. Um, this vinyl clad on aluminum alloy. It's much less expensive than bronze, and um, I think it's much more legible. And it's durable, I presume. And durable. And if in 20 years the vinyl is faded or 
um, or it gets defaced or whatever, it's $20 to, to redo the face of it. Oh. So the maintenance is not a huge issue. And a granite post, I'm assuming, will be, will be okay. It doesn't get plowed there or, you know, so it, it should be durable. Would there be any, um, I don't know, we, we have all this, the signs around town that mark all the buildings mm -hmm. where this is marking a, a park. Um, I don't know if maybe it would be a way to incorporate the, like the Welcome to North Andover, some more of that it's look. Similar design to mm -hmm. the other parks in town. Is that like the Drummond, like we have one, do we have one at Drummond? The reddish maroon, maroon and gold. Um, I think that we should leave it up to the committee. This park is a little bit unusual for those of people at home, and the ladies can back me up if I say something wrong. An Olmstead Park is truly a jewel. Um, Olmstead and his group built the Emerald Necklace, um, Central Park. Central Park. Mm -hmm. We are so fortunate in the town of North Andover by gift of the Stevens family that we have this in our town. So, and this, there's restrictions on the park. People don't, they're not aware of that. It's supposed to be for passive use. Right. It's not supposed to be, let's start a touch football game. Um, years ago, the policeman would scoot people off and say, nope, you cannot chip golf balls over here, <laughs> and things like that, in, in a very polite way. But that's kind of lost a little bit because it's a lot of those police officers that knew are no longer, they're, they're retired and, and enjoying that's other things. That's one of the things that got cut out of this new version. It's for passive recreation and quiet contemplation. That's what the park was designed, designed for. Mm -hmm. And um, if that got cut out, and I want to make sure that gets back. It in. needs to go back in because it's really kind of uncomfortable for someone to say, we know the children are all having fun playing tag in the park, however, and people overlook it, but we should be following full, the rules. Full football game would be fun. Yeah, we've seen that. <laughs> we've seen baseball games with. We used to get scooted off as kids. So yeah, we were one of those kids. It was like, you have this big green space. Why would yeah, you? Yeah. A few more trees could solve that problem probably for you. Um, um, and I truly so. appreciate everything. I'm a neighbor. I, I live on the next street over, and the park is a gem to the neighborhood and everything. I just, we have so many signs in town that kind of match as you go around. We talk about all the time, well, right? Well, I'm not crazy about too many signs in town. No, well, <laughs> but our, well, I just talk about our entrance. Of signs in town. <laughs> all our, the senior center, and we talk about conform, right? Everything matching. And that's all I was bringing up. Um, no, and I, um, could, I didn't take it any yeah. other way other yeah. than that. But. I, I tend to agree with Rosemary in that this one is unique. It's on the National Register, mm -hmm. and um, there was no other park like yeah. that. It also is, um, was one of the few that the, this is the Olmsted Brothers. Olmsted was gone by then. But this is the Olmsted Brothers firm from Brooklyn that, that designed this. And um, they also designed some of the a whole Newport long connection mansions to the and things town, like that, but, yeah. which is in the brochure. But I won't go into all that. But um, it was one of the few planned communities. It's the all the streets. It's called Tavern Acres, and it's it's the centerpiece of Tavern Acres, and it's the whole area, the whole neighborhood right there that's on the National Register. So that's different from Drummond Park. Um, and, and that's what we want to note on the sign, is that it has this significance, this value, and this purpose. Um, so that, that was what we tried to do. So this will be funded by Friends of Memorial Park, including the installation, or like what is the sort of logistics have, of how? We have um, written a grant that was, was due in October <coughs> to the um, Mass Cultural Council in town, hoping that... So the Cultural Council in town in is town. being asked right. to... Yeah. Okay. I think, but donations are accepted by... Of by course. By <laughs> <Amazon, laughs> obviously. <laughs> so get your pen out. And, <laughs> but I, I'd like to just take just a couple minutes. I've worked with these three ladies, and they have put their heart and soul into so many of our wonderful things in town. All of them. And... Um, 
and you've taken this this project on again. I was the one who dragged the hose around the park when we first planted the trees. Um, but um, it's so worth it. It's just, it is a jewel, and we are so fortunate to have it. And it's so well used. It mm -hmm. is. Especially during the pandemic. Yes. I, I oh, the chairs. Amazed, but people were yeah. locked in their houses, yeah. and, and they were so happy to be able to do that walk around and around and around. But um, <laughs> it really, it really was a testament to, that was what Homestead's whole thing was to get people healthier and out of their work spaces and in, into the nature. And so he was trying to create nature. Um, he created nature, you know. Um, he designed it so it would look naturalistic. Um, and, it, and it does. And we tried to maintain that. Um, we, we try to stick to the feeling of his plan. We're not, not doing exactly his plan anymore. Um, we're trying because change. Yeah. plants have been have been updated. Mm -hmm. They planted um, barberry, Japanese barberry, in the triangles where the people walk right by. They have thorns, <laughs> and and they're an invasive species. species. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, we don't want those. <laughs> so we have put those out, and we put in a native species of, yeah. of something else Just that great. blooms mm -hmm. and attracts pollinators and all that. So yeah, we're trying to be learn more, better, do better. You know, it's yeah. just. More part of the process. More natural. And that's not subject to any historic restrictions, correct? Because it's on the registry. How does that work? Um, there really aren't any. Okay. It's more of so it's not like a structure. An honorary right? recognition. Okay. Um, there real nobody really would enforce it if we did something crazy. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we've made it public, uh, no. <laughs> can curious. you think of anything, Pilot? What What would be the restriction? Then? Yeah, I don't either. Um, yeah, if yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah if, if, if I, somebody complains, if you, right? I imagine if you're honoring the intent, it's not a problem. We're not putting an ADU on it, so uh, <laughs> it's, uh, does the town the maintain it? I guess I'm confused about whose jurisdiction it falls I mean, under. I guess we mow it and everything. We mow it, and then yeah. you guys. I know I've been out there with you. I know that you're out there cleaning it up and pruning and planting and stuff like that, but okay. So I guess I see it better now. I, I didn't see it before. I, did, I thought it was just the middle piece here. Now I see that the border also is part of the sign. Oh, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't see that. I didn't realize yeah. that. I thought that was a, just an extra border. But now I see that oh. that's also part of the sign. So it all blends in better. I was, no, I'm, I'm good now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I, I thought it was just what, we, what I see here in the middle was what, what the sign was going to be. And oh, then, no, no, no. Yeah, it's now the I see it as the border yeah, the as well. So that all that blends in right. better. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, a white background, like an off-white background. So that's kind of what we see when we get here. Where the it's, text is, it'll yeah. probably be white. Be like or right. off -white. Yeah. something that blends a little bit. Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But the one thing, too, that you also did, and, and I remember Filer in both of you and Harold Duchamp, the, the dear late Harold Duchamp was so devoted to that park. Um, even the walkways are built in such a way that they're still handicap accessible, but they're, they're like kind of old-fashioned walkways um, where we, whatever we put on it, it stayed down and it didn't kick up dust right. and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. It's so much time and effort has been put into that park, and if we didn't do it, it really would have been such a tragedy to have lost such a great thing. So That was all Peter Hornbeck, who was yes. the landscape architect in That's town. Right. He had an office in the brick store. Um, he's since passed away, lived on Great Pond Road, and That's he right. studied under Henry Vincent Hubbard, who studied under Homestead, um, <laughs> all at Harvard. So he was very, um, Hubbard was the one who designed the park. That was his project at Homestead Brothers. And Peter studied under him. So when Peter heard this was going on, he basically donated his time yeah, right. to to redo um, the park when it, it definitely needed it. Things had been done that um, weren't in keeping with the plan, but we have the original plans. Um, That's neat. So.
it's a it's a great place for those of you who haven't visited it. You How should just you come by and take, <laughs> yeah. a, take a little walk. Think, and, yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. it's yeah. it's yeah. It's great. We're lucky to have it in town and all the work that you do because we walk all yeah, the time. We, so it doesn't go unnoticed for sure. It's a delight to be there. Yes. I'll tell you that. We appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah, we appreciate um, it. So is there any more questions about the sign? Do we want to see anything else before we take a vote? Okay, I would move that. approval. I'll second that. Thank you. Can I have a motion and a second? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, thank you. you. No, and thank you, ladies, thank you. and all the volunteers that help you. There's, I know there's others that aren't here tonight that have also very, but these these ladies are the core of how this got started and still at it. And thank continues you. Yes. on. That's for, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Keeps us in shape. So we'll be moving on to item E, which is approval of opera funding for $315,000 for a sewer connection. Oh, Jim, are you here? Yeah, here, yeah. Jim. <laughs> Jim, your sewer connection. Oh, Jim, sewer. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Jim Stanford, Public Works Director, uh, here requesting money for through the opera funds. Uh, this is a sewer project. Uh, essentially, a uh, little bit of background, uh, North Cross and South Cross, out over by Ray Street, uh, they were probably developed 30, 30 plus years ago. Um, Seems about right. At the, at the time they did that, uh, there wasn't sewer, town sewer in the area. However, they did some planning in when they were putting the subdivision in through the planning process. Um, they actually laid dry sewer mains for the day that would come when really? there's sewer out there. Uh, the problem is, is over time, wetlands developed, so the planned route that they had thought would be applicable at the time uh, is actually wetlands and really just, there's really no potential to go that route. Uh, a few years back, Ray Street Extension, new subdivision came in. Um, the planning board uh, worked with the developer to actually put in a pump station for sewerage. It actually goes out by Abbott Street. Uh, so essentially, they, um, they sized the pump station to accommodate future development or future connection of both North Cross and South Cross. Uh, the problem is there's just no funding mechanism to actually um, do what needs to be done. Uh, uh, the, the sewer, because it was planned a different route, it was actually planned, the dry sewer was to go out towards Summer Street. Uh, essentially that won't work anymore. So what we would need to do is relay about 250 feet of pipe, uh, extend a little bit more, um, and relay that pipe towards the pump station that's in place. And uh, that'll get about 25 homes on sewer. Uh, as I said, we don't have a funding mechanism, so enter Opera. We think that this is a, a good appropriation of the funds. I would note that most of, because of the dry sewers that we're in, uh, they actually put stubs to all the lots, although I think there's one that has to be relocated. Uh, essentially, this is just to make the connection in the street. It'd be a town system. Uh, residents would then be responsible for paying the connection fees and actually doing the uh, conversion from septic onto the new sewer system. So the request is for three hundred fifteen thousand um, dollars. Happy to answer any questions. So the houses were just stubbed, and they, there wasn't an actual connection to the house. That was a dummy connection. It wasn't, yeah, because they had to be on septic. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. So you know it could be expensive. Some of these residents, uh, yeah. we know a few of them have actually uh, uh, redone their septic system within the last five years. They're probably not going to connect right away, but uh, would there others, be a requirement for them to connect? Uh, we don't have that within our sewer ordinance, uh, okay, so no, that would not be something we'd be requiring. But once they have to replace those septics again, they'll they would right, definitely. That would, that would be <laughs> um, Melissa could probably speak to you know how many times she's been called by the residents out there, and over the years there were there were implications that eventually they would get sewer. Um, but again, there was never any funding mechanism tied to that. So that's why we think OPER is an appropriate use of this funds. Yeah. Sounds also like they tried, right? Like they tried to plan for it, which right. I give them. They did. For it. Not a lot of people do that. So. Yeah, and then as residents come in, they, they were told, you know, 
oh, you're going to have sewer someday. And enter 30 years later, and we have an it's opportunity. About, it's about the life of a sewer system. Mm -hmm. a system. Yeah. It's yeah, sewer it's should, should be a little longer. Unless you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, sewers should last a little bit yes. longer than a septic, yeah. What happens to the septic system when they switch over? Uh, there's, a, there's an ordinance through the health department. They actually have to crush them, and there's, yeah. there's a whole list of procedures, procedures. they have to do. So they yeah. don't just sit there? No, they okay. don't. Um, I think this is good for everybody. It's great. Take a motion. <clears throat> uh, Madam Chair, I'm the select board approved the offer request in the amount of $315,000 for a sewer connection along Ray Street. I'll second. Have a motion and a second. Any further questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much, Jim. Thank Thanks, Jim. I'll take a motion to move into licensing. I'll move that the select board acting as licensing commissioners open the meeting of the licensing commission. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are now on licensing. Uh, and we have before us an application from Richard Aversa of DNR Cafe Incorporated doing business as Diane's Cafe on the Common for a common victory license at 800 Massachusetts Avenue. So the applicant here. Yes. Good evening. As you may already know, Diane, my wife, and I put together a little cafe over at the uh, North End of Historic Society in the foyer. And we're hoping to attract more people into the building and then they can appreciate the incredible venue that exists there. And it'll be a, a mutual benefit for both the Historic Society and the town as well because we notice which we do ourselves, walk our dogs around the common and things like that. It'll be somewhere quick to grab, you know, a little cup of coffee, uh, a drink, a benefit, somewhere just to chill out. And um, our experience, Diane ran the our Ferry Street Grill in Everett for like 17 years. And that actually turned into a little senior citizen place itself. We used to have pinochle games in the back rooms when it was quiet. And so that's the main thing. She loves to interact. And once she meets anybody, she never forgets them. She remembers everything about them, what they eat, what their children will do. We watch kids grow up and hire them in the past to come to work with her at the restaurant. So it's something that's a passion more than a, you know, a business. It's what we want to do. Just she wants to enjoy the community as well as what she loves to do is cook for everybody and, and feed them. So hopefully uh, you'll appreciate that and give us a shot. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're going to offer? Uh, basically, it's going to be a quick breakfast sandwich type cafe. Um, we just got the brand new espresso machine, and Diane has been schooling to be a barista, so she's all <laughs> set and ready to go. Um, and then she also loves to just be creative. Married 40 years, probably had the same thing twice in my life. <laughs> so it's, You're like I said, it, it's a passion. <laughs> yeah, so. So Rich, am I reading these hours correctly, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m.? I mean, that's a no. long day, seven days a week. No, that's what that is, is that there's, we've agreed with the uh, no, the society that if there's events, okay. that we will be so there could available be. Oh. to them. So like movie night, that goes to like 9, 10 o'clock. Gotcha. Uh, then if they have any other parties, you know, we would be there for that. So Because again, it augments the society as well as being a free stand. So what will be your normal operating hours? Typically, she'll probably be there opening around 7 a.m. And we're going to guess to like 2 or 3. Okay. Because uh, like I said, Still it's a long day. little That's breakfast long and day. lunch. And seven days a week? Seven days a week? I think. Uh, probably, no. no. She'll pick the slower days, like the, in Everett. <laughs> um, in the winter and fall, Mondays were dead. In the summer, Wednesdays, for some reason, always died. So that will, be, you know. Depending on the demographics, yeah. who comes, who doesn't, yeah. she'll decide what day she wants to chill out and relax. So, expecting the middle schoolers on the way to the youth yeah. center. It's <laughs> a good stop for the uh -huh. youth center. Yeah. 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 She should stay yep. open until three. If you offer grilled cheese, they'll be She <laughs> actually, to give you a little history, we were the first uh, trans fat free restaurant on the East Coast. We oh, started wow. it way back then. If you remember Billy Coster, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. well, we were featured there, and the next day the doors were like, not, they were knocking oh, them down. Cool. Oh, that's cool. So, well, so you're going to do the same thing for this, right? 
she's already got the gluten free. She's got. The, you know, <laughs> People will be thrilled with it. Yeah, yeah. it's, <laughs> but it's certainly lab. something that's been missed on there since the Hayscales closed. You know, to have to be able to just go somewhere and grab a cup of coffee. On, or on even the, the general store. store. Yeah, yeah, the general store. They as well. used to grab yeah. their coffees there for she, decades. So. She have, we already have good. our own blend being made in, in, in local um, roasters roasting it for us. And, Great. We're ready to introduce it and let everybody uh, hopefully appreciate it. When will you be open, Rich? Uh, my no, wife okay, when, once, you right get, now, once you get this approved, we'll watch it on TV. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> the lights go on. Then she'll open it up. Yeah, okay. So. Great. That's funny. Yeah, when can we stop by this? Yeah, we're, we're not, <laughs> there you go. And we're not expecting parking to be an issue, right? Uh, as you saw, we mocked the parking lot. Yep. We have, what, 20, 23 legitimate spots, and then people tend to park on the other side as well, but we can't stop that. There is a parking lot down the street. The, exactly. And then, as we, I noticed during church, they'll go all the way up the hill, <laughs> off to the side, they'll put another 30 cars up there. And then, I think. Yeah, for a sort of place that's meant to be a quick turnover. It yeah. Should be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other Very questions? Exciting. Mr. Chair, I'll move the Select Board acting as licensing commissioner approve the application of Richard Aversa of DNR Cafe Inc., DBA Diane's Cafe, on the common for a common pictorial license at 800 Mass Ave. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Well, Congratulations. Very much. Congratulations. Congratulations. Best of luck. Look forward to seeing you all. Can't wait. <laughs> have a good Looking night. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, I will entertain a motion to go. I'll move yeah, that the select board acting as licensing commissioners close the meeting of the licensing commission. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are out of licensing. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to move on to consent items. And we're going to accept a grant to the Elder Services in the amount of $13,326 for bridging the digital divide. Accept a grant to the Public Works in the amount of $14,300 from Mass DEP. Accept a donation in the amount of $100 to the library from Richard and Marcy Rosenthal. Accept a donation in the amount of $500 to the police department in memory of Henry Fink II. Accept a donation in the amount of $500 to the fire department in the memory of Henry Fink II. Accept a donation uh, in the amount of $1,000 to the veteran services from, Fide from Fidelity Charitable and a donation in the amount of $20,305.65 from the Joseph, Joseph and Herman Youth Center, Inc. to the Youth Center. Wow. A lot wow. of donations wow. today. Wow. Thank you so much to everybody. Uh, I will move the calls. I'll move approval. 47, and almost 48,000, almost $50,000 in donations. Yeah, it's amazing. You just won. I will second with our gratitude. With, and yes. with, with letters usual, to all. Yes. Right, the thing. usual with disclaimer that, that you'd like. Thank you, card set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. I will yes. add that in. So. Mm -hmm. um, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? No, just a note of gratitude to the donations and to all the hard work for the grants that were written. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And then we will move on to the approval of minutes for November 8th. Has everybody had a chance to review? Madam Chair, I'll move approval. Uh, I will second. I have a motion and a second. Any changes, edits? No? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And we'll move on to select board updates. Anybody have anything? Uh, we have a website meeting uh, next week on Tuesday, I believe. I would like to thank the festival committee, which I think, you know, they've had a busy weekend this past weekend, and it was just a great, great, great event all around, event. and lots yes. of yeah. community yeah. participation. Yeah. And happy the faces. It was wonderful, and yeah. the last yeah. night was True wonderful. Lighting, yeah. The yeah. weather cooperated, because mm -hmm. that was... The weather was amazing. Unpredictable, <laughs> to say the least, and it ended up being fantastic. And the Festival committee is a big group of people, and boy, did they work hard. And some of those members have been on for, for decades a long time. and decades mm -hmm. and put their heart and soul into it. Um, so, what, thanks to the festival committee. Yes. Okay. Else? Um, 400 Great Pond Road committee should be coming in with a proposal soon, so stay tuned for that. That'll be great. <laughs> When is our next meeting? The 11th. I'm not sure if we're going to be the 11th or the next one after that, but 
When is the deadline for getting something on the um, on the warrant? When when does the, uh, the warrant doesn't open until January, and it usually stays open until almost March. 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 Yeah, sure. so, okay, so you get time for that. Okay. We just need to coordinate funding because capital plan is pretty much done, it's so we we'll have to coordinate that. Okay. So those who are celebrating the holiday season, we wish you all very happy Hanukkah and whatever it is you and you your family are celebrating. Um, if we that I think the next meeting. We'll add to that. <laughs> I think we have some holidays in between. So. Um, town manager, report. Thanks. Um, just uh, thank you to our employees, particularly the ones who have been answering the phones <laughs> over the last couple of weeks, um, and the police department, who, with Chief, under Chief Gray's leadership, have really been unbelievable to work with. So, okay. just my thanks. And that's it. I think we can say thank you to them all. Absolutely. We're, one of them. We're on the front lines. So. And for all their help this weekend, too. The yes. fire yes. department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so um. lots of scarlet. Scarlet was everywhere. It was a very busy weekend. Yeah. Yeah. saw scarlet at the Cramer Cruiser. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Market yeah. Fest, yeah. which uh, they got off to a good start as well. So. Oh, there's the Cramer Cruiser, yeah. and there's also the fire department toy drive. Toy, toy, toy drive. drive. That's right. Mm -hmm. That started. That started, too. So. Again, breakfast with Santa, the 17th. Uh -huh. I didn't know that. I was wondering about the date for that. So. And that's going to be in the old senior that's center. That's going to be in the new senior center. Hot yeah. off the presses. Even oh, the new senior center. They got the electrical in the gingerbread out. They're, they're going to figure it out. They're, 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 they're Yes, sorry. That it should awesome. be me. The Merchants Association <laughs> will have the gingerbread walk this weekend at the Masonic Lodge on Saturday, Saturday and Sunday. Oh. And I think it's one to five, both of those days. So. Let's stop by. Kind of a fun new thing that has not yeah. been done before. So that's exciting. And businesses are choosing to participate. So that should be good. All right. Our next meeting is December 11th. Mm -hmm. All right. At seven o'clock here. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Mm -hmm. Motion in a second. All those in favor? Yeah. Whatever yeah. one you want. <laughs> Aye. 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 All those in favor. All right. Thanks, everybody.